Good morning, Refuge Assembly. Good morning. It's going to be a great day in Jesus. Yes, it is. Do you feel the excitement in the air? Amen. Yeah. It's amazing. Amen. It's so thick you can cut it with a knife. It's just beautiful. And uh, a few oh, announcements. As most of you know, we have very, very special guests with us today. Dr. James and Marty Fent Amen. will be conducting service this morning. No, let me just say that in my words. This is the gospel according to Pastor Dennis. They are here. Show them some love. <laughs> that, Praise the Lord. And uh, we are here. We are going to hear from the Lord today. It's going to be an incredible day in Jesus. You know, last week was pretty incredible because yeah. it was Resurrection Sunday. Yes, man. it was. Yeah. Yep. But today is huh. just as incredible because he is risen. Yes, he has. And we are enjoying him this morning. Amen. Yes, we are. And we are blessed, like Pastor said, to have our guest this morning. Yes. We've talked about it a long time, and today's the day. Praise God. Today's the day. So if you came expecting something, you're not going to go away empty. Amen. We are going to hear from the Lord today. You're going to be encouraged. And then... After church today, we're having dinner. We've got barbecue, baked beans, fried chicken. <laughs> I mean, we're going to have a feast. What's that? It, that chicken's for you, Remy. I, we got that. Uh, he likes chicken. It, that's Remy. Everybody ask Remy. And she got chicken. She likes chicken, too. Oh, that's good. Praise we are just going to enjoy ourselves, enjoy yeah. the anointing that has been flowing. We've been blessed uh, many of us, we've been at a deliverance boot camp this weekend with Dr. Fenton Marty and Pastor Henry and Fran Schaefer and the yeah, team. Yeah. And it's been an amazing time yes. learning more things that we need Ooh. to be able to do deliverance right out of this church. This in good old soddy Daisy. <laughs> to who would ever... <laughs> So uh, it's happening here, and uh, the Lord has blessed and anointed this very time. For it, it, for su everybody say, for such a time as this. Yes. And uh, a few other announcements. As you could tell, we've been renovating in the kitchen. I won't give you the whole story, but it's almost done. But we got most of it done for, yeah. for this weekend. Yeah. And... Um, this past weekend at the boot camp, this was in Cleveland, Tennessee, we were all talking. I know, you, I know you're thinking, go ahead, ask me the question. What were you talking about? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. We are going to do another boot camp, but it won't be in Cleveland. At the, it's going to be right here. Right here. Praise the Lord. We're thinking sometime l late June, July, something like that. We'll keep you posted. Yeah. The next week or so, we'll uh, confirm the dates with Dr. Fenton, Marty, and Pastor Henry and the team from Aiken, mm -hmm. South Carolina. Because uh, we actually, that boot camp was sold out. We ran out of room. That, somebody say, that's a good thing. Amazing. So we got more room here. We told, uh, we told everybody, this is your second home. Dr. Fenton Marty. So we're going to do a, another boot camp right over here because somebody say and tap your neighbor Online say it's important right Go now. want to welcome you to Refuge Assembly. Uh, everybody say welcome. 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 welcome to our online audience. Amen. Uh, oh, Holy Spirit's already working. Uh, those online, yep, you might as well have a seat because you tuned in on a really special day. Now that's just Praise not a, Lord, yes. a byword. This is a special day. So uh, sit Amen. back, relax, enjoy the worship, and then when the preaching happens, fasten your seatbelts because it's going to be really good. Amen. So. Would well, everyone stand this morning? Yep. Amen. He's telling the online audience that they can sit down, but we didn't tell you. That's right. <laughs> you all, you all stand. <laughs> so welcome to Refuge Assembly. Our yes. website is Refuge AG tn.com and if you're watching this you already found us so that's good enough for me in the meantime let's times it's so hard being human so much 
much struggle, so much pain. Yes, there is. When I start singing hallelujah, saying goodbye to every change. I believe, I believe in miracle power, in a wonder-working God. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. His son, and when it feels like a I won't make it, I call on Jesus. Oh, I call on Jesus. I may not know what a day. Dr. Fent and Marty Fent, come on down. We say, come on down. Here's a microphone. Dr. Fent, are you switch that little switch there and say howdy. Howdy. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Folks, this is a great blessing to have them here this morning. We've, uh, we got to meet y'all, I guess it was about three and a half years ago. And uh, Bobby and Dee, they, uh, they were talking in the prayer room over there. And they were talking about, of all things, deliverance and generational curses. And Dee said, well, I know these people out of Aiken, South Carolina, that specialize, that do deliverance. Now, I wasn't in the room. I was over, over here someplace. And Bobby says, D, you, you do? He says, yeah. They're, and Bobby's next question is, how far is Aiken? <laughs> and, and then they call me in. Dennis, guess what? And then we started talking about it, and I asked the same question, how far is Aiken? Six hours later, just a few weeks down, we were down there getting going through deliverance ourselves. Amen. Bobby and I, because we have to try it first ourselves, because the pastors have to try it first. I, if it's good, we're going to bring it to the whole church. Guess what? It was very good. Yeah. It was very So, D, Bobby, you guys started this thing, and then we met you all, and we are so blessed to have you. Take we're it. Blessed. Show them some love, we're everybody. I just want to thank you all for having us, and it is a blessing for us to be here, and uh, we just know that God's in it. We just left the conference, and uh, it was so overcrowded. It was amazing, and uh, we have people here that have come again just because of that conference, and, you know, if God blesses us and we can have one here, we expect an overflowing. Amen? Okay. Amen. Amen. Thank you, honey. Yes. Good morning. Thank you, Dennis, for that introduction. You know, it uh, makes me anxious to hear what I have to say. <laughs> the first time I was asked to speak many years ago, the person who was assigned to introduce me got up and said, I don't know anything about him. I just met him. 
So if he's good, let's hear him, and if he's not, let's get it over with. So <laughs> a little bit about Marty and myself. He mentioned the movie Revelation, or uh, Jesus Revolution, the Jesus people. In 1972, it was the Jesus people that came into my office at the college I worked at and led me to the Lord. I had been in church all my life, but had never been saved, never heard about salvation. And uh, later that day, I saw them in the cafeteria, and they said, do you want the baptism in the Holy Spirit? And I said, if that's part of it, I want it. So I prayed for it, and I got it. So I went home and told my wife, and she says, well, if you got it, I want it. So <laughs> I prayed for her. And uh, since that time, actually, we've been... Well, actually, there wasn't any uh, spiritual churches where we were at, but uh, I changed colleges, went to a different place, and we found a, in, uh, a, a, a nice church that we thought was, you know, good, and they were spirit-filled and so forth. But I was suffering at the time from severe depression, and I was suicidal. In fact, I was probably within days of committing suicide. Somebody we had met who I thought was pretty strange through some, a set of circumstances came to see me and I, I told him what was going on in my life. And he said, Jim, you don't have to live that way. God, can you deliver you from that? Two days later, he came to see me and he said, you know, tonight's the night God's going to set you free. Because it was a generational curse and hereditary, both my children were also suffering from depression. And we were all at my house that night, and they cast it out of me. And I've never had a problem since. Uh, but they, they do, God does more than you expect, because he delivered me from smoking. He healed me of lip cancer because I'd been smoking the pipe. And that, he got my, God got my attention. He got my attention, and our lives have never been the same since. Uh, we just met my wife. I was going to introduce her. She's my my support, my helpmate, my prayer partner, and, and when I need deliverance, she's the one I call. She's also an, a great encourager. Although the, the way here, she told me, she said, "Jim, don't be too witty. Don't try and be too witty, too funny, and and too intellectual. Just be yourself." <laughs> so that's what you get. Dennis told you how we met. Uh, they came to Aiken, South Carolina and went through deliverance. We met them and we were here in 2000, and I think it was November of 21 that we came here and did a boot camp and administered some, some deliverance. And we became good friends. Although we don't see each other often, we talk on the phone quite a bit. But we've developed a love for this church because when we were here, you treated us like family. And Dee Mann, she's opened up her house to us again, and she treats us like royalty. <laughs> I tell you that to, to express our gratitude in being invited back. We really appreciate it. I want to introduce you to a Bible you may be familiar with. It's called the Spiritual Warfare Bible. It's, uh, I'm going to be reading from it today. It's got some excerpts in it that go along with the message, so I'm going to be reading some of those too. As you know, we live in an ungodly world. And it seems that those people who do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ have turned everything upside down. Violence has increased. Morality has decreased. People think they can choose what gender they are. Same-sex marriages, abortions, and, and the list goes on and on. But God is doing something supernatural. But most people don't even recognize it. He's developing an end-time army. And then one of the reasons I'm here is because I know God called this church to that end-time army. You're going to see more healings and more miracles in the future. Now, these are my words, not God's, but I think he would tell you this. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> so 
So prepare yourself to be used of God. There are going to be some hard times ahead, but if God will sustain you through all of them if you will stay in his will. Let's pray. Father, I am but a humble servant with a desire to see your church become all that you intended it to be. But before that happens, we must each look at our own lives and determine if our walk is in the obedience to your will. So help me this day, Lord, to lead your people through a message that would help them evaluate their readiness for what's ahead and their readiness to fulfill the call that you have on their life. Amen. We do a declaration. We always do this before we start a service. I bind a strong man and everyone here. Hear me, strong man? You've been bound. You cannot interfere. Turn to your neighbor and say, strong man, you're bound. We bind the spirit of Jezebel who runs most churches. And Jezebel, you have no place in this church. Amen. We command you to leave and go off this property. Amen. And if there's any unclean spirits that came in this place, with anybody or on anybody, I command you to leave too, in the name of Jesus. You know, it says in Scripture that you have to, before you can, uh, well, you need to bind a strong man before you do anything. And so we bound a strong man. Now, Marty and I were in the mission field. We were there for a few years, and, and God changed our, our direction. He gave us a new burden. He gave us a burden for the church in America. And at that point, we knew that our mission work was done, and, and it was time to come home. Since that time, everything we have done, everything, every place we have gone and, and God has sent us, our goal has been the same, threefold. To set people free, to change lives, and prepare those who belong to him to become what God's called them to be. That's my purpose again this morning. But the main emphasis is on helping you prepare for what God has prepared for you for your life. And if you're already being used of God, you're going to be used even greater. I'm sure many of you expected a message on deliverance. This is a form of deliverance. It's, it's self-deliverance. It's real, actually self-examination is what we're going to do this morning. I realized <coughs> when I was uh, asking the Lord what I would minister on today, and I had a lot of things come to mind, but the one word that kept sticking in my head was the word heart. I said, Lord, why, why the word heart? And he says, that's where I live. Now, I know that's not a new concept, but I want us to look at it from a different perspective this morning. It's a simple message, but I believe it can have a major impact on your life. The title of the message is, Christ is my interior decorator. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. This morning I'm going to take you on a journey. Let me read something that was written in this Bible. It's called the self-examination fast. But we're going to do it in a, in a, instead of a fast, we're going to do it in a message. It says in Leviticus 23, 27, we read about a one-day fast. What's that about? There's a confirming scripture in Jeremiah 36, 6. Both show us that God is saying, I want you to set aside a certain time that you will fast and seek me. And here's the purpose for it. Self-examination and consecration. When you do this fast, you need to say, God, I'm doing a checkup on my spirituality. How am I doing? Do I love you the same as I loved you when I first met you? Have I grown with you 
Is my passion, have I lost my passion for you? Is my worship at the level you desire? Lord, I'm bringing myself to you because I really want to do, be more like you and I need a self-examination. I'm seeing some things in my life that are not like you and I want you to help me deal with them during this message. It really says fast. Two years ago, Marty and I moved from Aiken, South Carolina back to Michigan. And we now live in a much, much smaller dwelling than we used to. So when we prepared to move, we had to go through our home room by room and purge. That means we had to get rid of all the stuff that wasn't absolutely necessary. Well, today we're also going to travel through my house, but not the house I live in. We're going to live in the, uh, go through the house that Jesus lives in, my heart. And as I search my heart, I encourage you to search your heart also today. We're going to allow Jesus to search my heart room by room and see if there's any wicked way in me. The trip we're going to take is something many of us took when we first got saved, born again. But it's something we need to do more often. Again, this is a form of self-evaluation. Self-examination is a better word. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17, it says that he, God, would grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. Another translation says it this way, that Christ may settle down and be at home in your heart by faith. One of the most remarkable Christian doctrines is that Jesus himself, through the Holy Spirit, will actually enter a heart, settle down, and be at home. Christ promised to live in any heart that will welcome him. Saints, that's an awesome promise. That's worth a hallelujah or an amen or something. <laughs> and we know that's true because Jesus himself said these words in John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will make our home within him. Jesus prom promised his disciples and us that he was going to heaven to prepare a place for us. That's in John 14, 2. But he also told us that it was possible for us to prepare a place for him in our own hearts right now. I'm sure this was beyond the comprehension of the disciples until after Pentecost. But the, but the point for us is that if you're born again, then Christ lives in your heart. What a privilege. When I turned my life over to him, he came into the darkness of my heart and turned on the lights and built a fire. The light of understanding and the fire of renewed passion. He brought music where before there was stillness. He brought harmony into my life where previously there was discord. He also brought joy to replace the sadness and he brought healing to replace sickness. And he filled the emptiness with fellowship. I let Christ into my heart to take up residence. He's, he's not a renter. He's a full-time occupant. I told him, Lord, this heart of mine is yours, so please make yourself at home and use this heart just as if it's your own. In fact, I showed him around and pointed out some of the features of his new home to make him feel more comfortable. I knew he was delighted to be there, as delighted as I was to have him there. But it wasn't long before he wanted a more in-depth tour of his new dwelling. He wanted to go in every nook and cranny of my house. So I decided to take him on through every room of my heart. And this is how he went through those rooms back then and how he still goes through them today. Now I have to admit, some of the rooms weren't very clean. But I was a new believer. 
But today I don't have that excuse. As we go on this journey, I'm going to share what he found in many of the rooms. But remember, some things have a tendency to sneak back in. So we need to go through the rooms of our heart often. But this is what he found the first visit. The first room that Jesus wanted to enter and visit was my study. What we call the study of the mind. Unfortunately, I discovered the room of my mind was small and had thick walls. In other words, my knowledge of spiritual things was limited and I was a bit hard-headed and opinionated. I also discovered that this room was extremely important because it's the headquarters of the entire house. He entered that room and looked around at the books on the shelves and the magazines on the table and I became uncomfortable. I used to like this room, but now that Jesus was in the room with me, I became a little embarrassed. There were magazines that his eyes were too pure to look at. Well, and, and there were books that he shouldn't be reading, no Christian should be reading. And as he uncovered the videos in the cabinet, he gently spoke these words in Psalm 101, verses 2 and 3. I will walk within my home with a perfect heart, and I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. So I turned to him and I said, Master, I know this really room really needs to be cleaned up now. Will you please help me clean this room? Help me pitch those old magazines and books and movies. And he responded and said, sure, I've come to do things just like that. And he told me to take all the materials I was reading and viewing, which were not good and spiritually helpful, and throw them out. So I did. Then he said, replace them with the books of the Bible. Fill your library with scriptures and meditate on them day and night. Then he gave me a gift, a picture of himself. And he said, hang this on the wall of your mind. You know, what he was saying was that when our thoughts are centered on Christ, when our mind is continually aware of his presence, purity, and power, then impure thoughts have to leave. I learned that any time that you're having difficulty with any little room in your mind, that control center of the house, bring Jesus back there and let him clean it up. Look again at the picture of Jesus hanging on the wall and keep your thoughts on him and get rid of that spirit of mind control. The next room he visited, pardon me, I'm a little dry, And this next one's important. The next room that he wanted to visit was the dining room. This is the room of appetites and desires. In contrast to the library, this of my mind, this was a very large room. It was very important to me. I had spent a lot of time trying to satisfy my desires. The first time we visited the room together, I told him, Lord, this is my favorite room in the whole house. I'm sure he would like it. So he seated himself at the table and said, what's on the menu tonight? Well, I said, my favorite dishes are academic degrees and moving up the ladder of success. And my favorite side dishes are watching football and playing sports. I thought I was offering him the very best. But when the plates were passed before him, I noticed he didn't eat. So I inquired as to why. I said, Lord, I said, don't you like the food? 
I was to discover that it wasn't the kind of food that you would feed the soul or satisfy true spiritual hunger. And in response to my question, he said, I have food to eat that you do not know of. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. Then he looked deep into my soul and said, if you want food that really satisfies, then do the will of your heavenly father. Put his pleasures before your own. Stop, stop striving for your own desires and your own ambitions and your own satisfactions and seek to please him, not yourself. It's the only way you'll truly be satisfied. Then he gave me another surprise. He gave me a taste of it. And as I, back then and now, taste of God's will, there is nothing that can compare to it. It has great flavor and everything else just leaves you unsatisfied. So let me ask you this. What's on the menu of the dining room of your desires? What kind of food are you feeding Jesus? 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. So the question that we must ask ourselves is this. Are my appetites and desires self-centered or are they centered around the will of God? At that point, I kind of hoped we'd visited enough rooms for the day, but Jesus pushed on. He wanted a complete tour, so we moved to the living room. This was a quiet, comfortable room. It had a warm atmosphere. I really liked it. Didn't spend much time there, but I liked it. It, it had a, 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 a nice sofa, an overstuffed recliner, a fireplace, and a very intimate and relaxed atmosphere. Jesus was delighted with the room. He said, let's come here often. It seems uh, secluded and it's quiet. And we can have some good talks and fellowship here. I thought that'd be a great idea. At that particular moment, I couldn't think of anything I'd rather do than spend time with Jesus. He promised that he would be there early every morning. And he told me to meet him there and we would start the day together. He promised that he would be there early every morning. So morning after morning after morning, I would go downstairs to the living room and we would take the Bible off the bookshelf and we read it together. He would reveal the wonder of God's truth recorded in its pages. And as he shared all that that he had done for me and would do for me, my heart would just leap with joy. These times together were wonderful. Through the Bible and the Holy Spirit, he would talk to me. And I would talk to him in prayer. Our friendship deepened during these quiet times of conversation and study. However, however <clears throat> under the pressure of many responsibilities, little by little, this time got shorter and shorter. Why, I'm not sure. I just assumed I was too busy and maybe too important to give Jesus regular time. There were matters of urgency demanding my attention, and they simply crowded out my time with Jesus. Sometimes I would miss a day or two, but sometimes I didn't show up for long periods of time. Then I discovered I was only showing up when I needed something. One morning I ran downstairs <coughs> on the way to do something important, I'm sure, and I passed the living room and the door was open. I peeked inside, and sure enough, Jesus was sitting there waiting for me. Suddenly it came to me. He's my guest. I invited him into my home and asked him to reside here to make my heart his home. He's my savior, my healer, my deliverer, and my friend. And he came here to live with me. 
yet I've been neglecting him. So I went into the living room where Jesus was sitting, and I said, Lord, I'm sorry. Do you come here every morning? He said, yes, I told you I would be here to meet with you. Now I really felt ashamed because he was faithful in spite of my faithlessness. I asked him to forgive me, and he did. You know, he always does when we acknowledge our failures and express our desire to do the right thing. But he did look at me with those piercing eyes, and he said, the trouble with you, Jim, is that you only think of this time of Bible study and prayer as a means of your spiritual growth. Well, that's true, it is. But you have forgotten that this time means something to me also. Remember, I love you. At a great cost, I have redeemed you. I value your fellowship. Just to have you call my name warms my heart. Please don't neglect this time with me. Remember, I want to be with you. When you truly understand that Christ wants to fellowship with you, that he loves you and he wants to be with you, that he's always waiting for you, it instills a desire in you to want to be with him. I discovered he uses this time to transform you into his image. Is Christ waiting in the living room of your heart? Or do you spend time with him every day? You have to bear with me because I have a big house. The Lord looked at me and said, do you have a work room in this house? I told him, yeah, I was out in the garage, but, you know, I... I didn't do much with it. I had a workbench and a few tools, but I didn't do much with it. Once in a while, I'd play around with something and make something, but I wasn't producing anything substantial. So we went to the, to the workroom. He asked to go there. I figured, you know, what harm could that do? I was soon to find out. He looked at over the workbench and the few skills and talents I had been given. He said, this is really well furnished. What are you producing with your life for the kingdom of God? He looked at a couple of small toys that I've tried to make. He held them up to me and he says, is this the sort of thing that you're doing for others in your Christian walk? I really felt bad, but I said, Lord, that's the best I can do. I know it wasn't much, but my ability is really limited. He said, would you like to do better? I said, of course I would. Well, he said, first remember what I taught you in the living room from John 15, 5, that without me you can do nothing. Now come and sit down and relax and let my spirit work through you. I know you're unskilled, but the spirit is the master worker. If you let him control your heart, he will do the work through you. Then he said, I want you to do what I do. I want you to set people free. I want you to heal the bodies, their bodies, and, and save them, deliver them. I said, Lord, I don't know how. He assured me his spirit would teach me. I am always amazed what he accomplishes through me if I just trust in him and let his spirit have his will. I still get in the way sometimes, but I'm still learning. I'm always amazed at what he accomplishes through me if I just trust him and let his spirit have his will. I still get in the way sometimes. But don't ever become discouraged or think that you can't do much for God. It's not our ability, it's our availability.
It really counts. Just give what you have to Jesus, and it's enough. The important thing is to be sensitive to what he wants you to do. Just trust him and he'll surprise you what he can do through you. Well, he wasn't finished yet. I clearly remember the day he asked to see the rec room. That was a place I went for fun and worldly fellowship. I was hoping he wouldn't ask me about it. There were a few associations and activities that I wanted to keep to myself. I guess I knew that Jesus wouldn't enjoy or approve of them. So I tried to avoid, avoid a visit to this room. But that evening, as I was about to enter the rec room, I wanted to get my fix for my addiction to Monday night football. Jesus was at the door. Ask if we could spend some time together. I kind of ignored him since it was nearly time for kickoff, and he politely retreated. The next night, I was about to leave and go out with some pals and friends. He was again at the door. Are you going out? And he said, I'd like to go with you. I nearly swallowed my tongue. I said, let's go out tomorrow night. We'll go to a Bible study or, or a church home meeting, but tonight I've already made plans. The Lord just smiled, but I could see the sadness and discouragement in his eyes, and he said, as you wish. But I thought when I came into your home, <coughs> excuse me, we would be going, doing everything together, that we would really be close friends, but know that I'm willing to go with you. Well, every place we went that night and everything we did, I had a m miserable time. I really felt rotten. I think it's called convicted. I had deliberately left him out a part of my life, and I was doing things and going places I knew that he would not enjoy or approve of. When I returned that evening, there was a light on in his room, so I went up and talked with him. I told him that I'd learned my lesson and I couldn't have a good time if he didn't go along. From then on, I have tried to include him in whatever I do and wherever I go. But after our conversation, he did something again that I didn't expect. He went downstairs to the rec room and he transformed it. I discovered my addictions had been removed. No longer did I have to watch football. No longer did I put in the extra hours trying to get promoted again. No longer were academic degrees so important. He brought me new friends, new excitement, new joys. There was laughter and music in the home. Th then he winked at me and he said, Jim, you thought that with me around, you wouldn't have fun anymore, didn't you? Boy, was I wrong. Remember, he said, I have come according to my word in John 15, 11, that my joy remain in you and that your joy may be full. Before we visit the next room, let me say this. The room we're about to visit is the bedroom. An example I use is of a single person. But it's equally important that God visit the bedroom of a married, married couple as his principles of sexual conduct apply to both. Well, the first time Jesus came into my bedroom, he noticed a picture of, on the wall of my girlfriend. Now, he knew that our relationship was good so far. But he also knew I was beginning to feel uncomfortable talking about it, but I really wanted to, to express and confess that my girlfriend and I were struggling with the same issue. 
you must have known what I was talking about because you read my mail. He told me I was beginning to question his teaching on sex, especially intercourse is only for those who are joined in the covenant of marriage. He told me he also knew that I was beginning to believe that, that he was asking the impossible and something that was unnatural. I also wondered how a young person or a single person could stay on the path of purity. Well, he was right, of course, and I confess that he was correct. Then he told me, listen carefully. First, anyone can stay on the path of purity by living according to my word and not striving, straying from my will. Then he said, I forbid adultery and premarital sex, not because it's bad, but because it's a good thing. Beyond physical pleasure, it's a means of bonding two lives in a deep and love relationship. It's an awesome gift, and it's extremely powerful. It has the power to bring human life into being. Used properly, it has tremendous potential for good. Used improperly, it, it destroys good. He said, you see, there's much more to love than sex. I have to admit, I felt better, but I was glad the visit to that room was over. I thought we were finished with the journey. I thought he'd visited every room in my house, but there was one more area that Jesus pointed out we needed to visit. One day as he entered, or as I entered, I came, was coming from work, and he said, there's a peculiar order in this house. He said, something must be dead around here. It's upstairs. I think it's in the hall closet. As soon as he said that, I knew what he was talking about. It was true. There was a small closet upstairs in the hall landing. It was just a small closet, and I kept it locked. But in that closet, I had one or two little personal things I didn't want anybody to know about. Certainly, I didn't want Jesus to know about them. They were dead and rotting things left over from my old life. And I had kept them a long time. They were nothing really wicked, but certainly not right or good to be in a Christian life. But I really liked them. I wanted them so much. For myself, I was afraid to admit they were there. Reluctantly, we went upstairs. With, I went upstairs with him, and he, as we got closer to that, that closet, the odor became stronger. Then he pointed to the door, and he said, it's in there, some dead thing. It made me a little angry. You know, I had given him access to my study to the dining room, to the living room, to the work room, to the rec room, and the bedroom. Now he's asking for the key for my little two-by-four closet. I thought, that's too much. I'm not going to give him the key. Well, he read my thoughts. And he said, well, if you think I'm going to stay up here in the second floor with that smell, you're wrong. I'll take my bed and go out on the back porch. And he started down the stairs. When you come to know and love Jesus Christ, the worst thing that can happen is to sense him withdrawing his presence from you. I had to give in. I said, okay, okay, Lord, here's the key. But Lord, you're going to have to open the door and clean the closet. I haven't the strength to do it. He smiled and said, I know you haven't. Just give me the key and authorize me to clean your closet, and I will. Well, with trembling fingers, I gave him the key. He took it, he opened the door, he walked inside, and he saw all the rotten wood that was there. He cleaned it out. But he also did more than that. See, he had delivered me by cleaning my closet. 
So he finished the job by repairing everything that was broken and giving it a fresh coat of paint. See, he always does more than you ask. Immediately, a fresh, fragrant breeze swept through my heart, Christ home. The whole atmosphere changed. What a release and a victory to have that dead thing out of my life. No matter what sin or pair of pain there might be in our past or your past, Jesus is ready to forgive and to deliver and to heal and make it whole. Then I had a brilliant idea. I had been trying to keep this heart of mine clean and available for Christ, and it was hard work. It seemed that I would start with one room and no matter get it clean, another room would get dirty. I was getting tired of trying to maintain a clean heart in an obedient life. I knew I wasn't up to the task. So I asked him, I said, Lord, oh buddy, is there a possibility that you'd be willing to manage the whole house and operate it for me just like you did the closet? Could I give you that responsibility? His face lit up and he said, I'd love to. That's, this is exactly what I came to do. You cannot live out the Christian life in your own strength. It's impossible. Let me do it for you. Then he said, but remember, I don't own the house. I'm here as your guest, and I have no authority to change or take charge of anything until the property is mine. Instantly, it all became clear. He had been my guest, and I had been trying to play host. So I decided from now on Jesus was going to be the owner and master of the house and I was going to be his servant. So I ran upstairs and got the safe which is a, where I kept the title to the property and I signed it over to him and told him he could run the house now. It was his. That's the day he took over my life. And it's the only way I have of trying to maintain the Christian life. I still stumble and fall, but no matter what room I'm in, the master of the house is there to pick me up, clean me up, set me straight, and put me back to work doing the Father's will. I pray that you allow God to visit the rooms in your home, in your heart from time to time. And be sure and sign over the title of your heart if you haven't already. My rationale for ministering, or maybe I should say my burden I have to minister, is to see lives changed. Saints, seek God. And let him visit the rooms of your heart and change your life. Something else I'd like to read in closing. If I can find it. Written by Cindy Trim. Many of you have heard her of her. There is a direct correlation between the quality of your thoughts and the quality of your life. Here's the principle: you now you will never have more, or go further, or accomplish greater things than your thoughts will allow you. Your life is a reflection of who, of what your most dominant thoughts are. When you make, uh, when you, uh, excuse me, when you make it a practice to meditate on success, you will begin to live a successful life. Psalm 138 or 139, verse 1 says, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. And my confession is I will not adjust my walk with, with Christ to fit the agenda of the world. Amen. Let's wait upon the Lord a minute.
often the Lord will give me a name sometimes. Sometimes they're here, sometimes they're not. Was there someone here named Tom that needs prayer? Or you know of someone named Tom that needs prayer? Would you stand in proxy for him? Come on up there. Who's he need prayer for? Um, he just had a massive heart attack. And um, today, um, they're sick with his cousin off the life support. So wow. that's why he's not here. Okay. Raise your hands. Let the Lord touch you. Father, we lift up Tom. His wife right now stands in proxy for him. As we anoint her, Lord God, we ask you to give him strength through the death of his cousin and through the problems he's had with the heart attack. Heal him, Father, now in Jesus' name. Gave your heart to the Lord a long time ago, didn't you? Receive him now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 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 